Terrific. All right, so welcome to our panel. Why is Wicca the fastest growing spirituality in America? And contemporary Wicca, which is also known as the craft of the wise or witchcraft, would allow us to change that title to why is witchcraft the fastest growing spirituality in the United States? That is a profound and completely unexpected phenomena. And it's driven largely by women who are increasingly willing to come out of the broom closet despite hundreds of years of persecution and distortion and uh, demonization, not just discrimination, but demonization. And so today's panel is a chance to hear from a group of very remarkable women, all of whom I just admire tremendously, who are gonna join me in exploring the very remarkable, profound rebirth and the meaning and the value and the future of one of humanity's oldest spiritual wisdom traditions and one of its newest uh, and its meaning to the world and to each of us. So I'm Phyllis Curat to introduce myself. I'm one of America's first public Wiccan priestesses. I'm also an attorney and an author and a trustee of the Parliament of the World's Religions and the program chair of this year's convening. And I am joined by this remarkable group of next generation leaders and practitioners. And I wanna introduce them. Pam Grossman, wave Pam, so they know who you are. There we go. Pam Grossman is the host of the Witch Wave podcast, which is just fabulous. The author of Waking the Witch, Reflections on Women, Magic and Power and What is a Witch? And she's the co-editor of the forthcoming Witchcraft, a volume of Passion's Library of Esoterica series, which is stunning. Tonya Brown, wave Tonya, say hi. There she is. Oh, lucky girl is in New Orleans and she's the author and she's editor in chief of Witch Way Publishing, which is just remarkable. Twyla York. Say hi, Twyla, there we go. Twyla York brings a very important perspective as the organizer of Chicago Land Pagan Pride and uh, an organizer also of fundraisers and educational events in the American pagan community for more than nine years. And also with us is the absolutely delicious Jasmine and Wooly Michaels. She's a PhD student who worked with me in the Women's Spirituality Department at the California Institute for Integral Studies. And she draws extensively from the two sides of her Igbo, Nigerian and Indian heritage in her exploration of traditional indigenous spiritual practices, including Wicca and shamanism. So today, rather than an act, a dry academic conversation, I really wanted us to explore what brought each of us to witchcraft. And then to explore your thoughts on why witchcraft has become the fastest growing spirituality in America. So I'm happy to start being the, the oldest uh, uh, witch in the panel here. Um, 40 years ago, I was a lawyer in New York and witchcraft was the last place in the world that I ever imagined I would find myself. And it was exactly where I was meant to be. And it turned out there were no stereotypes, no hideous hags, no weird potions, no supernatural forces, and absolutely no devil, no stereotypes. I didn't find a single one. Instead, what I found was the modern rebirth of the Euro indigenous wisdom tradition, the tradition of my ancestors. And I found a spiritual practice that worked, that provided experiences of the divine. And it was a divinity that wasn't remote or abstract or transcendent. It was, and it wasn't male. It was imminent, it was present, it was embodied. It was within and it was all around and it was distinctly feminine, also masculine, but distinctly feminine. It was a goddess. And I also discovered a role for women as spiritual leaders, which um, at the time, certainly in the late seventies and early eighties was not characteristic of the dominant faith traditions. Uh, that I had grown up around. And that was all very um, profound, transformative and altering for me. And it was very empowering. Um, and I discovered that uh, the word witchcraft not only had nothing to do with the stereotypes, but in fact came from a 5,500 year old word, witcha, W-I-C-C-E. And it meant a wise one, a female, a, a wise one, a shaman, a seer of the sacred, someone who maintained the balance between realms of spirit 
and the so-called material world. And who knew that the two worlds through which one moved easily back and forth were actually one. And over time, uh, my appreciation for the spiritual practices and what they enabled me to see uh, was a world that embodied the divine. And, and now after 40 years of practicing, one of the things that I most value is the gift that it's given me of experiencing the natural world as the embodiment of the divine, as a spiritual teacher. And it, it is to me probably one of its most precious gifts. Every faith tradition has something of value to offer the world from its particular perspective. And as the rebirth of an indigenous wisdom tradition, I think for me, one of its greatest gifts is this capacity to experience creation, the world that we live in the natural world as sacred and to treat it with reverence and respect and which has always been healers. And so it becomes a path, a means of engaging in healing to heal the relationship um, that we've had with the earth, which has been very exploitive and very damaging for it instead to be one that's imbued with reverence and respect um, and to be able to participate in the great magic of creation. So that is what witch witchcraft has been to me and the reason that I am very comfortable now publicly um, for 40 years, uh, calling myself, maybe not so much a witch. I think I kind of prefer to use the word witcha, the original term. And Wicca uh, was the male, but it has come to be referred to as sort of one of the branches of witchcraft, one of the movements of witchcraft. Uh, so that's it. So that's my, uh, that's my five cents. I think that's about five minutes, right? And I'm gonna invite uh, Pam, you really beautifully describe what drew you to witchcraft in your book. Would you share some of that with us? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for having me in this sacred circle. I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Phyllis, and thank you to everybody watching. So, you know, I feel compelled to add to what you've just said, because so many of the elements that attracted you to witchcraft also called to me, certainly the feminine aspects of it. I was raised Jewish and I didn't like hand in my Judaism membership card. So I still consider myself Jewish, but also a witch. Sometimes I'm being cheeky. I call myself Jew witch. So one of the things I do love about witchcraft is, you know, there are many people who turn away from their religion of origin and turn towards witchcraft. But then there are many of us who still integrate our family lineages and traditions and kind of braid that together with witchcraft. So I think of the word witch as a modifier or an amplifier, as opposed to this like alternative identity of rejection and rebellion. So I like to rebel a little bit too, let's be honest. Um, but for me, what witchcraft offered me that at least the way I was raised in Judaism and I was raised a reformed Jew in suburban New Jersey, you know, I had about mitzvah, I went to Hebrew school, but we like weren't keeping kosher or anything super, super hardcore. We were re reform, as I said. Um, and, you know, I went to a relatively liberal temple and yet there really wasn't that centering of the feminine experience. And I know that that's evolved since, you know, the eighties when I was a child for sure. Um, and so I, I certainly agree that witchcraft centering the feminine aspects of being was super attractive to me. I'll also add that witchcraft has this paradigm of honoring the light and the shadow of honoring darkness and winter and grief and loss and anger alongside love and light and you know all of that and i think that's a really healthy way to be a human being um you know in my light studies of psychology it, it's become clear that when we repress that which we consider to be dark and i'm not talking evil i am very against evil and harming other people but when it comes to things that we associate with darkness things like desire and lust and 
um, pain and, and barren times. Um, if we repress those feelings, we know that they just bubble up in toxic ways. And I would much rather honor the gifts that come in darkness alongside the gifts that come with the light and figure out ways to integrate them in my life so I can be a more balanced and integrated person. And so I can find the beauty in all aspects of nature and life because as we know, spring is wonderful and joy is wonderful, but life is also sometimes painful and fruitless. And um, witchcraft has really helped me find the magic of being in all of these different contexts. And the last thing I'll say is that I'm attracted to witchcraft because I'm attracted to magic, capital M magic, the idea that we all have power inside us to manifest our dreams, yes, but also to build a better world together, to harness the power of our imaginations and tap into our own gifts that we've been given by what I call capital S spirit and then collaborate with other magical beings, which I believe all people have the potential to be, to envision and manifest a better, more just, more kind, more loving world. So those are the things that come to mind for me. Would you say that the, the things that attracted to you were part of um, what attracts other people as well? Part of, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think that when it comes to um, some of the more, you know, we'll call them organized religions, um, a lot of the feedback I get from readers of mine or listeners of mine is that, you know, a lot of people, and this is not to disparage any religions, I think there's beauty and truth in, in all religions, but the ways in which religion is often fed to people is to only focus on the light and to only focus on the kindness and the goodness. And, and, and that's important, but I think it's important to honor all of those shadowy aspects of, of being and of nature as well. Um, and the other thing that people tell me often is that, you know, look, witchcraft is complicated because we are decentralized. You know, we're all often fond of saying there's no Pope of witchcraft. And that means we are constantly remaking it, reinventing it. We're able to define it unto ourselves. No one of our paths looks alike. I bet all five of us in this conversation were drawn to witchcraft and read different books and had different teachers. And there might be some overlap, but a lot of it is about trusting um, the signs and your instincts and the call. And because of that, it's a very personal form of spirituality. And um, I think people are really looking to be self-defining and, and that doesn't mean reinventing the wheel over and over again. We have a wonderful tradition of texts and traditions as well, but I do think it allows for a bit more customization and flexibility and adaptation. And, um, you know, the world is changing so, so quickly. So to be part of a spiritual path that adapts really quickly too, I think is a really wonderful thing. It's a uh, bottom up, a grassroots. It's, there, is, there is no prophet, there is no guru. Um, as Van Morrison said, there's no teacher. There, there is a teacher, I think. But yes, it is. It's a path of personal responsibility. I mean, my own feeling is that that as the longer you walk it, the more you discover that your path is unique. But we're all sort of traveling in the same general sacred landscape, and so we start through the use of the practices to, to have similar kinds of experiences and draw sort of similar conclusions as you for example you were talking about the the fullness of nature in its encompassing of both dark and light of death and rebirth that the, the, it's the totality that engages one not just one aspect of it um so tonya would you i'm gonna move on and ask you to speak to the same two questions of what drew you and how you're practicing and what you think the appeal is, you have a marvelous view from where you sit with the magazines that you've published and the work that you're doing. 
Um, to really go off what Pam said, uh, I really agree with something witchcraft has is it has such a reverence for darkness. Um, and I sometimes feel like I kind of had a leg up. I was not raised Christian. Um, my family was very religiously explorative. Uh, so we had a lot of different um, perspectives on spirituality and religion. And I was told at a very early age, like, explore, figure it out. You want to go to church this week? Cool, let's go to church. But like, hey, you want, like, it was just very, very much a religious free-for-all growing up. Um, so I sometimes do feel like I came at this at kind of a different perspective. Um, my great aunt was Wiccan and that was kind of how I first discovered like witchcraft is a thing. And, uh, we still lived in a very, very, very small town. So while I was introduced to witchcraft and I think what, I really liked about it and what really drew me to it is exactly what Pam said I loved the darkness I was such a like just weird little kid I loved ghosts and death and like oh there's this episode of unsolved mysteries where like they're bringing people back from the dead I'm like yeah that's like I was so into that and like witchcraft was kind of the thing that leaned towards that you know we have um we have necromancy and witchcraft which is all about the dead and I was really really drawn to that um and I think that is still a huge part of how I practice today like 15 years later is the darkness and I think the fact that witchcraft allows unapologetically so much beauty in darkness and shadow and all of that I think is phenomenal. Um, and one reason I did go through a stage for a few years, where I kind of broke away from witchcraft, like my early twenties, I was trying to be like society, like, a, you know, I, I wanted to be normal, like, like everyone else. Um, and I felt something was missing and I was so happy to be able to rediscover it. And one of the big things for me, I think the reason why it stuck as heavily as it did, and it wasn't just like, oh, my aunt does this, I'm going to check it out, and I'm going to move on, is I think a big part of it was I grew up in a very, very small country southern town where there was so much oppression just because of what it was. So there was um, judgment if you weren't a certain religion, if you weren't a certain gender, if you weren't a certain race, if you weren't, there was so much uh, just, I feel like there was a, like oppression everywhere. And that is why I think witchcraft is such a fast growing spirituality is because people who feel powerless and people who feel oppressed can find power there. And I think when we look in history, anytime there's been a huge upheaval in, uh, the world and society, we see witchcraft go up because people feel like they're not being heard. They feel like they, they've been, their power has been stripped away from them. And now here's this spirituality that's for everyone. Witchcraft has existed in every culture. So everyone has an equal welcome to it that says, here's some power. But not only that, it's however you need it to be, to be what you want to be. and. Yeah, I just, I'm very happy to have found it. <laughs> and I don't know who or what I would be without it. And I'm very grateful that I had a family that allowed me to do it. And um, yeah, I think uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Ray Bradbury. But he says, you know, witches are, um, witches are born from the hungers of their time. And I think we see that every like 20 years. And uh, yeah, I'm just really proud to be a part of this amazing community. That's and that's all. Thank you, dear. It's a very interesting question of the attraction of the darkness, the dark stereotypes of the witch, the darkness with which women have been viewed, right, and oppressed in the culture, um, and the the kind of liberation that comes from from a, a full penetration 
right? Of, fa of facing the shadow and moving through it um, and how it one transforms and um, the perspective that you have on, on um, so I just want to take a moment uh, because I think it's important to clarify for folks who might be, you know, listening in from other parts of the world who have absolutely no sense of this, that, that when one is speaking of darkness, we're not speaking of evil, right? that the notions of evil, in fact, that most of us are raised with tend to come from a, this sort of schism between light and dark and good and not good, right? And, and, and the, the stereotype of evil has been projected with the devil, this, you know, the sort of embodiment of this figure who comes from the patriarchal traditions has been projected onto indigenous people and certainly onto women and onto um, the craft of the wise. But with its perspective of, uh, it's often referred to as a nature religion. I mean, I don't think that that's the right phrasing, right? But it's a nature-based cosmology. Um, that when you look to nature and see it as sacred, what you see is life and death, winter and summer, right? Um, aging, loss, uh, all of the things that the culture has tended to reject and say are bad, but they are an essential part of the process of life. And you view them differently and you experience them differently. And it enables you to go through grief, to go through loss, to go through aging, to experience death, which comes to everyone, to all those that we love, and to yet continue to be in the presence of something that is profound and sacred. Right. So, I mean, I used to say, like, if a tiger eats you, you know, it doesn't make the tiger evil. It makes you lunch. And that's a tragedy for you. But the tiger isn't evil. The tiger is a part of the natural order. And the contradiction we all live with is that life feeds on life. It's a fixed system. Right. Um, but one thing is always becoming another. And this is part of the magic of creation, that one thing is constantly turning into another. And our sorrows you know, give way to joy. And I'll stop talking now <laughs> and ask Jasmine if she will join the conversation and share with us, uh, your path has just been very marvelous. And there is a, uh, there was when I began a third, more the a third of my coven were, um, were black women who played an incredibly important role and brought a certain diversity within themselves to our experiences of women's circle. And there is now a growing movement of black witches in the United States and elsewhere that has so enriched uh, what it means to practice witchcraft, what it means to practice Wicca, what it means to explore and develop this path. So I'm, I'd love it if you would share with us what drew, the, drew you to it. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, thank you so much for having me be part of this conversation. At first, I wasn't sure if I fully belonged here be just because um, I was raised, I was raised sort of in my traditional indigenous spirituality. So I wouldn't necessarily call myself a witch. I, I associate the word witch with the history that has gone along with Wicca, which is from a specific community. You know, it's the European indigenous spirituality, whereas I have my own indigenous spirituality from Nigeria and also from India. Um, and in Nigerian culture, we use the word Dibia, which is um, kind of a word that includes shaman and mystic. And some people might say witch as well as a bunch of other things. Um, but what led me to this path was that um, I started having experiences that I couldn't describe and explain by, by Western or Christian religious standards when I was very young. So I was having visions when I was like eight or nine. I was having experiences with spirits when I was a child. And um, it was very, very difficult for me to integrate those experiences and be physically fully here. So my, my path was a very personal and intimate path of trying to, um, I knew the experiences I, were, I was having were valid. And when I spoke to my family members or people who were deeply spiritual, they knew my experiences were valid. But when I tried to reflect them out into the religions around me, I was, those experiences were demonized. So what I wanted to understand was who else in the world is having similar experiences to me? 
And it was all well, of my friends who were white. It were the friends who associated themselves with witchcraft of my friends who were black. It was my friends who either grew up very Christian, but had a very gospel and deeply rooted spiritual practice. Or it was my friends who um, practiced their indigenous spirituality from whatever culture they were from. If they were Puerto Rican, they had their spirituality. If they were from South America, they had their spirituality. Um, if they were indigenous, you know, from Canada, they had a specific spirituality. So what I ended up realizing was that the, the connecting thing wasn't whether I called myself a witch or a shaman or a mystic. It was, do I practice indigenous spirituality that's based in nature? Or am I rejecting that part of myself? And so what's happened for me is that the deeper I've come into my own spirituality as an Igbo person, um, the more I find myself in these circles because these are the people who resonate with what I'm saying. And um, what has drawn me to, what has kept me practicing my indigenous spirituality every single day is number one, it, it works. It really works. There are uh, there are actual things that come from giving nature offerings and praying to tree spirits and believing in the aliveness and consciousness of water and learning that my physical female body is connected to the moon cycles. There are real things that come out of that. And so the more I practice privately with nature, the more I feel myself uh, sane in a world that seems increasingly distorted to me. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the other thing is a sense of awareness that like nothing is really what it seems on the surface. So I'm, I'm very aware of the ways in which I, I'm studying religion right now and women's spirituality. And I'm very aware of the ways in which black people have been demonized throughout history. Um, women have been demonized throughout history and even animals are continuously demonized. Snakes are demonized because they're close to the ground, meaning they're close to the earth, meaning they're close to the mother. So we demonize them. And so for me, this has been a process of how can I, how can I look at the aspects of life that are demonized and try to find the places where, um, where there's space for healing rather than fear. I have had my experiences with negative energies as well as positive. I'm very aware of the presence of the reality of evil and I don't take it lightly. So when it comes to practicing for me, I'm very private and I don't um, make a big hullabaloo about anything that I do because um, I think the energy that we put out, we have to be very careful about. And so I'm not somebody who will ever, you know, cast love potions to try to get something or anything like that. That's not my, that's not my thing. But I do understand that, um, you know, there's a fear that's been like really deeply entrenched around the power of the female body and the power of women. And that fear has been associated with evil um, and the, the richness of like the void within, a, within all of us has been totally overlooked. So a lot of my spiritual practice um, revol revolves around making peace with that within myself. What are the parts of myself that I don't know how to look at that I'm afraid of? Or what are the traumas that my family has had to go through that are just being carried with me, you know, all the time? So for me, it's a very personal practice. It's a practice of supporting other women to reconnect with themselves. I know I have my own in indigenous background, but as I said, a lot of my friends are white. So my white female friends specifically, especially the ones who were raised in America, who weren't raised in Europe, how can I support them in finding a connection to their own indigenous spirituality that speaks to who they actually are and acknowledges the trauma that, that is really there, that they've gone through, that no one talks about because it is real. And I think that um, as I've healed my own trauma in my, in my own way, um, I've just found a lot of beauty and a lot of richness and a, a much deeper sense of belonging with nature. The idea that men are on top of nature, really it's men and then women and then animals and then trees and then er the earth. It just seems absolutely absurd to me. It's a circle. There's no hierarchy for me in my experience of life. So um, I find that most indigenous people around the world understand that. I think witchcraft is the fastest growing religion because truly I believe that European people and people with European heritage are reawakening to that reality within their own community. 
I don't think this is new for brown people at all, um, but I think that it has been heavily oppressed in the white community through organized religion that has now spread to the rest of the world. So I think that as that's healed, um, we are gonna be finding a lot more places that we can reconnect. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's a big part of what's going on. That's my opinion. Thank you, darling. <laughs> I knew this was going to be just splendid. Oh, thank you. That was brilliant and insightful as all of uh, the remarks that preceded yours. This is all, each one of you has opened this incredibly rich vein of possibility for conversation. So um, I hope we'll be able to do a second one um, and continue it, if, if not on the parliament forum, then elsewhere. So Twyla, I bring the question now to you, which is what uh, has been the appeal for you and, and what do you perceive from that perspective to be the reason that witchcraft has become the fastest growing spirituality in America? Thank you for inviting me to the panel. I've been enjoying listening to everyone's experiences. Uh, for me growing up, small town of um, not a lot of diversity, um, but for me within the church, I never felt connected to it. Um, nothing bad happened. I just didn't feel connected to it. And it wasn't until I discovered paganism that I felt that my physical person and my spirituality connected together. And since then, it feels like I'm a living piece of art, constantly creating and expressing and expanding and sharing within the universe and within magic. And since the discovery, I've been what I like to use the term so, socially filled. And it has been that capability to learn, express, grow, and connect the universe in however way that connects my spirit and my physical being into one. It's not one way, it's not, this is how it's always going to be. You are a living piece of art that this universe has cast among the stars. And so therefore you are constantly shifting energies with that since the stars are energies and you're radiating it. And I think that it's part of the reason why it's growing as fast as we are is because you've got this, You've got all of these stars that are now realizing that they have this energy within them, they have this power, they have this beauty, they radiate it all the time. And instead of having to go this particular path, they now have this universe of paths that they can travel and shine them shine among. And as it grows, we're now seeing the diversity of it and accepting the diversity of it and celebrating the diversity of these individuals who are creating their magic or creating their universe and are sharing it with the rest of us. Um, I also think that we're also realizing those who weren't already connected, that the people that are now coming into it are accepting the sacredness that is earth. And they're looking at the mainstream religions who are looking at earth going, we are separate. We are religion and we are earth. And they're looking at it going, no, the, the earth and the universe that we're in is as sacred as anything else because we're all intertwined. If you are seeing the separation, there's a fault to that. But here's now where I'm seeing this path that has always thought the divine with it. Maybe that's where I need to be, where maybe that's where the path belongs. So understanding that we are all stars in this universe, we're all responsible for the universe that we are in, and we're able to radiate that outward and do things to help make those changes with our inner power, with our inner beauty, and with everything else that we have to create, change, evolve and hopefully protect the divine as well as helping the divine grow. Sorry, I keep forgetting. You, you've been overseeing uh, uh, Chicago and Pagan Pride for a long time and you've really watched the community grow. So what, just briefly, um, you know, what, what do you think has been most distinctive about the uh, about this growth? The openness and the openness to diversity. So being in Chicago, we are a gateway to everything. No matter what you want to find, somewhere it's in Chicago. And I think that's great. And that's all offering people, even if I'm not going to practice the way Jasmine is, I can talk to her. 
and we can learn from each other and that can then open that up further. And I really think that's how Chicago has been able to grow um, as well as other uh, larger cities is that we are this hub of everyone mingling together and having a space where we can share ideas, share our practices and cross between it. And again, we're basically taking our individual art that is our magic and going, and making a brand new piece that we're now setting out there and sharing with the rest of the community and the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've we've got about 15 minutes or so, and I would just love to throw the floor open and everybody, you know, open your mics. And um, uh, I was trying to take notes, but I, I didn't want to separate myself from what you were saying. So I just sort of grabbed some words um that really struck me um and maybe they can you know sort of give a little shape to the conversation back and forth magic and what magic is embodiment um very much in terms of the earth and in terms of women um and women empowerment and what that means um and how those things are all connected magic embodiment the earth women empowerment um and that the, the other theme that came out is the uniqueness of each path and yet, and the diversity, and yet this sort of shared common sacred ground, what that means. So tell me what magic is to you. Ugh. Come on, somebody. All right, I'll start. I mean, my idea of magic has changed over the years. And, um, and I still don't know what it is because it's still so magical and mysterious. But these days, I tend to try to describe it um, mostly as the flow of the sacred into an open heart, you know, that we issue an invitation for what is numinous um, about life to, to, to greet us, to join us, to, to be with us, right? We open ourselves. And when we do, magic begins, it starts. Right? And it is the flow of something indescribable um, that, that comes into us. First thing magic changes is you, changes you, rattles, you know, rattles your cage and breaks the windows and tosses out half your closet and you know, makes you crazy. And, suddenly opens you up to dimensions of spirit that most cultures, you know, the traditional patriarchal religions have told us are elsewhere. And suddenly you discover they're right here. So it, you know, it's made accessible to you in all kinds of ways. And the practices for me help, so, you know, these shared indigenous practices to keep that magic flowing and it changes you. And then you change it, you shape it, you work with it. And whether you create a baby or a magazine or a book or a PhD, you know, or what some younger practitioners would call a spell, right? That it's an offering, that, it, that that energy flows into you, changes you, you change it and you shape it in whatever form you wish or are meant to you offer it to the world and the world is made better for your having done that, um, which to me is the great magic of creation that every, all of life is contributing to create the conditions that engender and nourish and sustain life. That's the great magic of creation. And so we participate in that and we start living in a sacred way and magic for me has become the word that describes that kind of state of engagement engagement of like the old image of the shaman as the point of connection between spirit and earth and it's flowing back and forth and we're we're facilitating that that makes sense yeah <laughs> i i love that phyllis and i was hoping that the word creativity would get brought into this conversation and Twyla's words about being a living work of art is so moving to me because actually a lot of what I've learned about magic comes from studying artists and um, 
I got a lot of my start and a lot of my footing into this world by curating art shows and studying writers and musicians and painters throughout history who used their art as almost a, a portal of transcendence, uh, uh, of some kind of a door that you walk through to have access to this experience of imminence and transcendence that I think we all have access to if only we are present enough and aware enough and uh, paying enough attention. And so for me, when I am working with magic, I feel like I am a collaborator in or a co-creator with spirit, that I am not just a passive vessel that's being filled, though there's part of that, but I am also an active, um, uh, an active being of energy that expresses that magic into the world through my own personal gifts and visions and creativity. And it's all connected. It's, it's, you know, being both completely grounded in yourself and knowing your own value and beauty and power, but it not stopping at a point of ego because we are all that, because we are all extensions of capital S spirit of source. And so, I, yeah, I think creativity is a really important part of magic. I don't know that I have a perfect definition for magic, but it feels like the current that creativity expresses itself by or with or through. Yeah, I think um, something Pam said that really hit the nail on the head for me is the word awareness. And for me, I think that's what magic is. It's being able to go through life, being aware of everything, of paying attention, listening to um, the little voice in your ear, uh, you know, being aware of signs. Like, I feel like it's just about going through life with as much presence and awareness for every aspect of it as is possible. Um, yeah, I think that that's all I've got. Um, something along the lines with that too is the personal responsibility. We are batteries. We are constantly living and dying within our bodies and radiating energy, but we are also walking in a universe that also do the exact same thing. And we're responsible for that. And whether we are doing a spell or a ritual, picking up trash, yelling at our neighbor, whatever we're doing, we are exchanging energy in this universe. And so we're responsible for that. Magic, part, part of me for magic is that I take responsibility for the energy that I am radiating and controlling the magic that I am radiating and trying and projecting out into this world. And I accept the consequences that will come from, from that and take those consequences within myself and transform that into a lesson to learn and to grow and to expand. So it's not just a passive thing necessarily, it's an active thing that you acknowledge and you also take responsibility for and you work on developing and expanding and just growing in general. This is, this is such a rich and interesting question. I've really been, as everyone's been talking, I've really been thinking to myself, like, what is magic really for me? Um, and I think for me, there's a few things. So I always want, I always wanted to experience the aspects of life that weren't um, like visible to the eye. And I think a lot of that came from my dream space because <clears throat> I was experiencing and I think a lot of us have these experiences. We experience things that we can't describe in our dreams. Or, or things that we know are real, like we'll experience emotions that we maybe can't like put our finger on. Um, and to me, there was a lot of magic in that. So having a dream and then seeing the dream unfold in real life later, or getting a sign and then seeing that sign somewhere else and really understanding that there's, there's actually a message in that. Um, I think that's part of the magic. Part of magic is um, when the universe communicates with you and you can actually hear it and you can actually start to understand. For me, it's like learning a language. I think the universe, God, spirit, the self, the I am, whatever we want to call it, it's supremely intelligent and it's always trying to communicate with us. 
And I think um, the problem is that a lot of the time, whether it's because of our culture or the time that we're in that's very technological, or whether it's just part of humans, humans evolution right now, we've kind of closed our ability to perceive the information that's there. I think magic is what happens when you start to open up those senses again. I don't think that magic is actually supernatural in any way, because um, I think that the intelligence of the universe has always been this way. It's been this way before humans existed, and it'll be this way when the earth and the sun go back to being together, you know, when it, when it all collides. Um, so yeah, I definitely see magic in like, in starting to understand that <laughs> even just with my pets, I have a dog and a cat. I remember one day I was alone with a, a cat that I had in the past and we'd been at the house for like a few days. And I realized this cat's been communicating with me for an entire week. Of course, he's not talking to me with words, but I was realizing he just told me he wanted something, you know, and even just that communication starting to open up again because I was present enough to start to pay attention. That's magical. And I think when we practice um, anything like yoga or breathing exercises, it gets more intense because there's a lot of power in the human body, whether it's Kundalini or whether it's just just our physical energy, being aware of the way our bodies work, um, being aware of the signs that our cells are are sending us all the time. There's a lot of magic in that. I think when people get a little spooked out sometimes is when they realize how much information is really there how much our bodies are communicating with us. So that's a huge part of magic for me. And then I would say the other part is just being able to feel the intelligence of the universe and the consciousness of nature. So the spirit of water, the spirit of the wind, the, the, the consciousness of the four directions. Sorry to understand that these things are alive. I think that's the other aspect of magic that has been probably the most humbling for me. And in a, in a world that that feels kind of confused, it's given me a sense of center. Like the magic has been, I have a direct connection to source that is totally unique and um, personal to me. So that's kind of how I would describe it. These are absolutely gorgeous, all of them. Um, and I hope that whoever is listening has had uh, um, whatever negative stereotypes they might've been uh, carrying blown into oblivion and to shattered into lots of little pieces that can be remade into something life-sustaining and aesthetically fabulous and um, soul nourishing, which is uh, for me, ultimately, what it means to be a witch, what it means to be a wise one, somebody who's paying attention and able to see the sacred, whether it's coming to us in dreams or through our intuitions um, through signs and through embodiments uh, expressed by each of us and by the world that we're living in uh, to rediscover that, that you know, we're living in a sacred place and to begin to learn again how to live in a sacred way. Everything we need is inside of us. Each one of you has expressed that, that part of the gift of this particular spiritual uh, movement is that moment of, of discovery, of awakening to a capacity that connects us to the world that we're living in, to the spirit of that world. And, and it and is a means by which we can find our way home and start to live in a new and a sacred way, which is precisely what's need, needed right now. The world needs her witches, which has been healers. And this is the time for healing what's been broken. So I thank you all for the wisdom that you've shared today the beauty of your souls and the magic of who you are. And, uh, and thank you all for those of you who visited with us today. If you have questions, put them in the thing and hopefully we'll be able to see them and address them. And uh, stay tuned for more. I think we're gonna have a part two of our discussion which will be on our various uh, websites and social media. So thank you ladies and thank you all who've watched us today. Blessed be, as the old expression goes. <laughs>